Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning or afternoon. Sorry. Um, I think we'll get started. Perhaps we'll have some more trickle in uh, through the rain. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Stapp to us, to the DSRJC community, to speak to us on Kierkegaard and Silicon Valley. Um, Mark is a, I, we, we met a little while ago, had lunch, and um, I found Mark um, to be a comfort to me because there aren't very many people around who have the kind of background, the educational background that I have, a bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD in theology and religion and the like. Uh, so it's great to have a colleague to share those stories with and to share that experience with. Mark has a BA in religion from Williams College and an MA and PhD uh, in divinity and theology respectively from the University of Chicago, no mean institution. Uh, Mark is also a curiosity to me. Uh, with all of that education, all of those degrees in religion and theology, uh, he doesn't work as an academic, as a, as a professor or teacher, um, but he has a rich and illustrious career in other, in other areas. He's currently the Director of Development at Sonoma State University and has held, held several other posts in the financial and healthcare world. So I, I like I, to use him as an example to my students um, as someone who can uh, get a PhD in, in theology and philosophy and things, subjects like that and still get a job. <laughs> other, than, other than the one I have. Um, so I, I think that, that, that he's a great example for that. And also, I find delight in uh, finding a fellow connoisseur of Kierkegaard. Uh, Mark and I shared stories over lunch about um, not only studying Kierkegaard, but, um, but visiting his, uh, the, the remnants of his study in the mu city museum in Copenhagen, where Mark confessed to having planted something in the desk, in Kierkegaard's desk. I didn't, I wasn't so bold. Um, but uh, Kierkegaard is a fascinating figure, one I've been fascinated with for a long time throughout my academic career. I see that there's another colleague, who, uh, um, a department colleague who teaches philosophy, Diedrich Franzek, uh, who's also a Kierkegaard connoisseur. And so um, I know that we, and I hope the rest of us, will enjoy and be enlightened by what Mark has to share with us. So please help me in welcoming Mark Stapp. Is this on now? Perfect. Um, Eric, that was much too kind an introduction. Um, with respect to obtaining the, the PhD and then not going on to, to use it in any kind of professional career, my wife will be happy to explain to your students why they should never do that. <laughs> um, that remains a, a source of some controversy around the family. Thank you, for, thank you for taking time to come out in the rain today. Um, I like how everyone is seated you know, apart from one another. This is just the image of Kierkegaard right here, the lonely individuals on the, on the rainy day. Um, who, who here has read Kierkegaard, incidentally? Are there, are, there's a few fans in the audience. Perfect. All right. Um, well, for those of you who haven't, one of the goals today is just to talk generally about Kierkegaard's thought, to do a little bit of an overview with relevance to a, to a contemporary topic. Um, and Kierkegaard versus Sir Silicon Valley, um, it's a little eye-catching, and the genesis of that is probably that for most of my early career, I was working for tech companies. So I was finishing my, my studies while working, while, while working in, uh, for software development firms. So I had kind of a foot in both worlds, um, or a foot in both worlds, foot in both worlds. Uh, and then my wife and I lived in the city for about 10 or 12 years, and we had friends throughout the industry. So we'd be going out to dinners and sort of, uh, you know, we, we were around the tech community. And it really, st it really stood out the, um, how confident that community is in terms of what human reason was gonna be able to accomplish. There's, just, there's, a, there's a, an enormous amount of confidence there. And that always stuck in the back of my mind. So when I was, when I was talking with Jeff about, about doing this presentation today, I thought, well, that might be kind of an, an interesting topic to explore. So that was, that was the genesis of it. Um, so in addition to talking about Kierkegaard, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the similarities between the 19th century, uh, early 19th century uh, intellectual climate, um, specifically in Golden Age Denmark and a little bit of what we see in, in the tech industry today, specifically in Silicon Valley. Um, and then at the end, to, sub to suggest how Kierkegaard might think about some trends in the valley. So for those of you who have not read, read Kierkegaard, 
reading Kim Kierkegaard Ashian is actually not a bad way to get into it. So every, every day, Kim faces new struggles in her, in her daily life, and she has to figure out how, how to, you know, put these finite challenges into conversation with her more eternal concerns. Um, there are many such posts. And so uh, Kim, Kim's a decent guide if you don't want to go straight to Kierkegaard himself. Now, I wanted to include a few cocktail party facts about Kierkegaard with emphasis on cocktail party, because Kierkegaard is one of the best names to drop if you're at a social affair. I mean, you're not gonna, you're not gonna walk into a party and talk about Hume or, or Kant, um, but Kierkegaard makes you sound like a free thinker, somewhat literary. And so two, two facts to keep in mind about Kierkegaard is that he's generally considered to be the father of existentialism. Um, and existentialism is a word that's often used and very nebulously defined. Uh, it was a, it's a group of loosely connected thinkers who focused on subjective human issues, who looked at the world from the perspective of how do we go about our lives as, as individual existing human beings. And other names that get tossed into, into the mix include figures like Nietzsche, um, Sartre, Camus, Heidegger. Uh, and really the one thing they, they share in common, aside from the fact that they, they're, they're focused on, on the lives of individual existing humans, is that they all drew from Kierkegaard. Oftentimes, they didn't, they didn't uh, properly ascribe their thoughts to Kierkegaard, but they were, they were drawing from him. Uh, and the second cocktail party fact is oftentimes when Kierkegaard's name is mentioned, people will say, oh, yes, the leap of faith. Uh, but he never actually wrote that phrase. He talked a lot about leaps. He talked a lot about faith. He was very interested in the, the, moment, the moments prior to critical life decisions. So whether it's to, to get married or to perform a heroic act, Kierkegaard was very interested in how, how is it that, that an individual human being decides to go forward in that particular situation. Um, because it's never a straightforward logical process. So he spent a lot of time exploring that. Um, his biography is fascinating. There are, there are not that many philosophers whose biographies it is, it is worth reading. I mean, the Kant, for example. Kant got up and he went and he walked to his office and he wrote and he walked back to his house and he never went more than 10 miles from his hometown. Kierkegaard's biography is worth reading, if, not, if, if only just for the love story, which we'll talk about later. Um, but he lived during, Kierke during uh, Denmark's golden age. So this was a period in, in Denmark's history where in, every one of the or in almost every intellectual er area, there was, some, there was some sort of brilliant figure taking shape. You'll recognize names like Hans Christian Andersen. Um, the physicists in the audience will recognize H.C. Oersted, the father of electromagnetism. Um, and in, in every other area, there was some brilliant figure, and Kierkegaard was in the mix. Uh, in his roughly 10 years as a public office, he wrote nonstop. He wrote 30 plus published, published texts, um, th thousands of pages. Uh, then a, private, a, a set of private journal entries, which was you know, nearly equal in size, uh, just wrote voluminous, voluminously. Uh, he modeled himself after Socrates a bit, and so even as he was part of the social scene, the, you know, the, the, um, the upper-class social scene in Copenhagen, he was always prodding his contemporaries um, in, in, in both an intellectual and, a per in a, and personal sense. Um, and again, he was, he was focused on how, questions, uh, how individuals must pursue the truth, which, as we'll see, was a little bit at odds with the, with the climate of the times. Here are two, you know, again, as a general introduction to Kierkegaard, here, here are two ways that he talked about his own era. Um, notice that first phrase, because of the copiousness of knowledge. Kierkegaard was very interested in the fact that in his, in his day, a day that w it was universally agreed to have remarkable progress in all, in all intellectual pursuits, that the explosion of knowledge had not necessarily led to a deepening of thought um, of individuals about how they, would, how they might best live their individual lives. So yes, there were, there was, there were dramatic um, changes in technology, dramatic changes in, in different kinds of understanding. But did Kierkegaard want to ask his age, do we know more about courage? Do we know, about, do we know more about what it is to live a good life? And his answer was no. And these, these, are, these questions are not, are not primarily um, technological or, or intellectual questions. Um, and he was also concerned with the lack of passion in his age. Um, I just like this quote but he was, he was convinced that his age was a little too rational, a little too disassociated from, from individual pursuits. Question? Yes. What is the name of this? What number is this? What is he referred to as? What is the name of that inwardness? So, good question. Inwardness is a, is a categorical term for Kierkegaard, which for our purposes, would, we, let's, let's take it to mean deep self-reflection. So, a, a, a turning inward to, to examine how, as an individual, I understand myself, or I as an individual, and coming into relationship with, with other people or, or other things. 
so we're going to talk. We're going to start to put Kierkegaard into context of his time now, um, and with one particular thinker who was who was Kierkegaard's bête noire, Hegel, George, Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel. Um, but when we're talking about Hegel, who really was a dominant figure of the time and continues to be influential today, we want I want to read Hegel in a broader sense. That Hegel was indicative of, of of broad intellectual trends of his day, many of which overlap with some of the trends we see in the tech world today. So here are here are some shared general assumptions of the philosophy of Hegel um, and the Hegelian climate that, in which Kierkegaard wrote and, and the tech world today. There's an interesting shared problem of fragmentation. Um, and I wanted to put this problem up there, one, because it, the, the, the different kinds of personal and political and social fragmentation that, that thinkers of Kierkegaard's day were, are, were concerned with, those problems are also present today. It's another interesting point of connection. Um, but also, I didn't want, to, I didn't, I don't want to, I don't want to make either Hegel or the tech world into too much of a cartoon character. They really were dealing in, in profound ways with difficult questions. We're not going to do them justice today, but I at least wanted to, to put a bit of a, a, a tickler there. Uh, so they had the shared, they had that shared problem, and they had an extreme amount of confidence in human reason to be able to think through all the issues. So you've got all kinds of psychological and political and social, social problems. The solution to those problems is to think harder, to think clearer, to think more objectively. There's a, a, a belief in the inevitability of progress. Um, in both cases, I mean, in, in, both, in both the early 19th century and, and in you know, the tech world today, uh, objectively speaking, you look around, you saw the technological and the intellectual progress, and it was, it was remarkable and it was obvious. Um, there is a tendency in both of those communities, I would argue, to to shade the progress in those technological and intellectual areas over into progress in other areas, sort of more, more moral and, and, and spiritual kinds of areas. There was a, both Hegel and Silicon Valley were, were, were primarily concerned with broad groups of people rather than focusing on individual individuals, you know, existing individuals. Um, and there was a, there, there was a, a strange kind of um, spiritual quasi-religious um, bent in certain areas of both, both communities. And I want to underline this because this was one of the real catalysts for me, for me thinking about this subject. Hegel, as is well known, believed that he had, he had identified essentially God's guiding intellectual principle as it flowed through the course of history. And in his own work, human beings came to see the universe as God sees it. There was that kind of quasi-messianic element in his thought. Um, in Silicon Valley, in certain, in certain corners, there's something, I don't know, somewhat analogous happening um, with talk of the singularity. Uh, how, how many in here have heard of the, the singularity or, or follow? Perfect, a few of you at least. We'll talk about it in more detail, but there's, there's a, a similar, there's a, a, an analogous um, discussion of the universe coming to self-consciousness in and through the, the technology of artificial intelligence. So through human ingenuity, We've got, to, we've got a kind of flowering of self-consciousness in the universe um, that is somewhat sort of quasi-divine, quasi-spiritual, and it is, it is tossed around a lot in futurist circles. And the, the fact that there was this, this odd parallel um, I thought was worth exploring. So back to the, back to the shared problem. Um, believe it or not, this is the best picture of Hegel I could find. He's not, he's, you know, he's a bit of a daunting, a daunting uh, image. Um, the quote talks about Hegel's view of his, own, of his own society. And the lines like, you know, political life was universally devoid of principle. Um, and, you know, individuals, individual conviction without objective truth and pursuit of private rights and enjoyment. Um, these are the issues that Hegel and his contemporaries were dealing with. And they were, they, they were such a nice parallel to some of the discussions we have today. I thought, the, I thought the quote was worthwhile. And again, in the very brief discussion of Hegel's system that will follow, I don't want to make him into too much of a cartoon character. He was dealing with real issues in a brilliant way, as Kierkegaard himself acknowledged. Um, but also, a, a, um, you know, a, a very a kind of an idiosyncratic way. So if you, if you here's, a, here's my final question. Who's, who's read Hegel in here? Yeah, that number should go way down. Uh, Hegel, Hegel is tough, very, very complicated. But, the, but a couple of the phrases that you, you will re probably have picked up at some point is, uh, in your lives is the Hegelian dialectic or the Hegelian system. Well, if you, if you do, here, here's, here's the, here's the two-minute version. So Hegel saw all of the conflict and fragmentation of his day. And he said, you know what? That is the, that is the genesis of, of history. That's the, that's the engine of human history. So yes, you've got, these, you've got these conflicts, but through the use of, of, of human reason, 
we can reconcile them into, into higher unities. And we can follow this single logical principle all the way up from, from you know, uh, elementary physics and elementary biology all the way up into the you know, most abstract regions of, 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 human, of human culture. Looks like, so we created what's known as the Hegelian system. And this is a, a very small abstracted version of it. I've got a, I've got a, a sort of pasted together version at my, at my wall at work. Um, just very big, very detailed, just all the, all the different areas of the sciences, all the way up to, you know, the most abstract parts of our, of our culture. Um, we will not get into the details of this. The points to, the points to take away are that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it in a second. The points to take away are that Hegel had this just remarkable, stru mar remarkable intellectual structure that he created. All right, very well thought through, brilliant. Kierkegaard himself said, this is brilliant, that if Hegel had just said that this was a thought experiment, he would have been the greatest philosopher that ever lived. He managed to you know, aggregate and, and categorize all of human knowledge. And Hegel was not shy about his accomplishment. And Hegel very, very consciously and publicly said, in the, through this work, and for anybody who understands this work, you're entering a new era, a new era of higher human consciousness. You're becoming a new being, in fact a, sem a, a semi-divine being. You're seeing, you're seeing the universe and the progression of, of, of understanding through the universe from God's perspective. So the three points to take forward as we talk about Silicon Valley, um, the three points of comparison will be, again, the emphasis on human reason, the emphasis on progress, human progress in, in, in our, various our various activities, and then a sense that, that you know, humanity is about to evolve into some kind of new higher level creature. Um, it, seem, it seems strange to talk about this, um, but really, both at that time and, and in some corners of the valley today, this is, this is discussed with honesty. Um, if it seems comic, that's, that's not bad, because Kierkegaard also thought it was kind of comic. So with respect to the, to the, um, the emphasis on intellectual structures and, and human reason, Kierkegaard looked at Hegel's, that, that giant system of Hegel's, and he said, you know, yes, it's brilliant but it's as though an architect has, has put up a, a, like a castle and then lived next to it in the doghouse. So you've got, yes, you can think it through, right? I mean, there's a, there's a, there is a logic here, there's a coherence, but what is the relationship between this intellectual system and how I as an individual will actually make decisions in, 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 in my daily life? The comic element in Kierkegaard, I wanna highlight that for those of you who haven't read Kierkegaard, there aren't many philosophers about which you could say truly that they're funny, for Kierkegaard, um, comedy and humor are philosophical, ca philosophical categories. So there are funny moments throughout the texts. With respect to the inevitability of human progress, uh, this, is, this has to be Kierkegaard's most famous quote. I mean, you can see it on the top of, of the walls at BevMo. You'll see it in, in any general um, discussion of Kierkegaard, but it's also a good quote. Um, and he makes the point very, he, he, he looks at Hegel's system and he looks at that, that general sense of um, inevitable and predictable progress that was predominant in his culture in the early 19th century. And he says, this is great. Assu even granting that you've correctly understood the last 6,000 years of human history, let's state that for the, for the point of discussion, you can't actually truly have confidence in what you believe going forward. You can't truly live your life or, or see the world as God sees it. Maybe you understand the past, but you're blind to the future. And this existential point makes all the difference. And Kierkegaard, take, uh, Kierkegaard addresses um, Hegel's point about human evolution um, pretty directly too. Uh, to the, to, in, this, this quote is worth reading at length, you know? Um, to, the, to the point about the human beings being something different now from what, what we were in the old days. Um, isn't, isn't our essential duty uh, and our essential condition the same? We're existing creatures trying to figure out how to, how to, how to live our lives in, in, in good ways. Um, how to be moral, how to be courageous, how to be happy. And that second, that second clause there about um, the most important aspects of existence not being a matter of knowing. Kierkegaard will again and again come back to this point that Yes, intellectual and technological pro pro progress are important um, and wonderful, but there's this other discussion of how I, as a human being, must, should be developed in, in an appropriate way, um, in a worthwhile way, and that isn't strictly a matter of, of, that isn't strictly a matter of um, information and technology. I liked it that um, Jaron Lanier, uh, who was one of the, the um, Jaron Lanier was one of the, the, the guys really to kick off virtual reality. 
so he now works at Microsoft Research, um, but he had a quote that was in parallel with Kierkegaard, so I wanted to include it here, where he too says, you know, information can be as much a distraction as, as a help. It's a very Kierkegaardian point made by, made by somebody who's very much in the mix of the, of, of the, of the tech discussions. So we've covered these questions, but I'll, I'll put them up here just to, to hammer them home. Um, you know, Kierkegaard asks Hegel, you know, does, the, does your thinking have consequences for an existing individual? Are we really making progress in the most essential senses? Um, and then the, the final question, or the, the, the final point there is, um, is something that will, is very much of relevance to our, our discussion of Silicon Valley. You know, is this kind of objective, systematic, intellectual approach the best way to, to affect change in ourselves? Is there some other kind of conversation that has to, has to appear? And Kierkegaard himself obviously thought there was, and in the, in the structure of his writings, he attempted to, to create something like that. He, his writings are very consciously unsystematic. Um, and in his mind, again, sort of taking the so Socrates and the, the role of gadfly seriously, he wanted to nudge his readers in various direction, directions without lecturing to them, without giving them a philosophical structure. He wanted to present to them different life options for personal evaluation. So as we, as we start talking about the, uh, as we start talking about Silicon Valley, um, again, with, with, an, with the goal of not creating a, a cartoon character, um, of, of, the, of Silicon Valley and the tech industry more generally. I wanted to at least paint a, a happier picture of how, or a, a more positive picture about how Silicon Valley began. Um, too often now, Silicon Valley or sort of is, is become a, a euphemism for tech gadgetry. So you've got your iPhones, you've got your, um, you've got your PowerPoint, you've got your Microsoft Word, your various word processing programs. And so there's a temptation to think that really the guiding principle from the dawn of Silicon Valley or the start of the tech industry was to create those kinds of gadgets. When in fact the ambitions were much broader from the beginning. I mean, you go back to um, the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab in the 60s, um, Douglas Engelbert and his, in, in the, the nearby park labs um, as he was trying to create um, objects to extend human capabilities with an eye towards solving huge world problems. Um, you get into the, the 70s and the personal computer revolution. I mean, everyone's familiar with the story of Steve Jobs and, and um, the, very, the very spiritual nature of his quest to transform the industry, where he's dropping acid and marching around India. Um, and you remember the, 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 fa the famous 1984 Apple commercial where he's very much positioning the personal computer as an agent of indiv in, in, in the individual um, empowerment and political change. There were much broader aspirations um, to, to the tech industry. In fact, this would be a, this would be a decent topic um, at some point in the future to talk about some of the you know, countercultural influences on, on tech um, and some of the really profound thinking that went into it. Um, but you can see vestiges of it today. Uh, look at the mission statements from three well-known companies. Um, you can see the, the universal aspirations. We're, we're going to create universal communities. And we're going to have all information be available. There are, just, there, are, there, are broad, there are broad goals here, and I think it's worth highlighting. So we're going to talk about three Silicon Valley projects um, as examples, and you probably won't recognize these as Silicon Valley projects: love, immortality, and the singularity. Um, but let's let, let's show how they how they exist. So, with love, I think you're familiar with these with with these examples of companies that are out there trying to match up human beings and create lasting relationships. Um, I hesitated about putting Tinder on there. I don't really. I, I, we don't really need to have Tinder on there, but I, I, I did. Um, let's focus on eHarmony for a second. You know, you've got your, you've got your, you've got your Venn diagram, you've got your science, and you've got your love, um, and you've got your traditional sort of emotional kinds of qualities that we're, that we're used to associating with love. And then we're pairing that with machine learning and algorithms and, you know, all sorts of techie stuff. And, you know, without, if, we don't, if we don't look too deeply into that, it seems... It seems like great. All right, we can have we can have a tech company that's approaching this 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 issue. Um, but upon further reflection, does it really make sense that we, or you know, upon further reflection, what role does technology actually play in the situation of a human individual trying to find, let's assume, some kind of lasting, happy relationship with another individual? Again, ignoring Tinder there at the bottom. Um, you know, Kierkegaard would say, if you're if you're really interested in finding love or finding a relationship, first of all, you have to know yourself. 
what are your needs, what are your, what are your fears, what are your anxieties? Um, and then you have to have that kind of same deep knowledge of another person. That, this, that the, the thrust of this, of this, um, of this issue here is between, is, it involves a lot of inwardness, um, a lot of self-reflection, and technology can be marginally helpful to the, in, to the extent in which maybe you can communicate with another person. I mean, the telephone was probably helpful to relationships and letter writing and maybe the internet. Um, but when you, start to, when, you, when you start to shade the technology aspect over into the more qualitative parts of forming a relationship, is there really a role to be played here? Um, is finding love a technology problem? And, and following on that, I think Kierkegaard would ask, you know, if, when you start, if, if you're starting to focus your attention on things like big data and machine learning and mobile apps, are those, are those truly helpful or are they distractions? And perhaps one way to start answering that question is to, is to ask, uh, you know, has, we have so much more technology that goes into courtship and matchmaking relationships. Are we better at dating than we were before? Has there been some kind of qualitative improvement in, in human matchmaking? And if not, what, what does that answer say about the, the earlier questions? Now, to be fair, Kier Kierkegaard is not maybe the best person to lecture on dating. Those of, you who, those of you who know his story um, know that there was this epic on-off um, love affair with a woman named Regain. Um, that reading for this story alone is, or this story alone is a reason to pick up Kierkegaard. So if you're not into critiques of German idealism, but you like, you know, love stories, then, then you can find it in almost every book that he, that he writes, since he chooses Regain, he chooses this failed relationship as his metaphor in, in so many of his philosophical discussions. Um, the, the sort of behind the scenes, or the, the quick story here is that he got engaged to this other very socially prominent person. Kier Kierkegaard was from one of the wealthiest families in Denmark, I should have mentioned that. So Kierkegaard was this extremely uh, you know, prominent individual, got married to another extremely prominent individual in the form of Regine. It was this celebrity courtship. They were together for a year. Then, then Kierkegaard suddenly, when without warning, um, ended the relationship, causing a scandal in the community. The, the, literati, the, the literati were aghast, Newspaper, newspapers printed reports. Um, and then to, uh, to make things even more awkward, Kierkegaard published a book shortly thereafter called Either Or, um, one of his most famous. And one of the essays in that book was uh, an essay called The Seducer's Diary, in which detailed the seduction by a young philosopher of an innocent young, of a, of an innocent young woman, um, with lots of loosely veiled sort of, you know, allusions to regain. Um, Obviously, Copenhagen society was scandalized. Um, he was labeled as disgusting by figures from Hans Christian Andersen and, and onwards. Um, and the, it, much of the rest of his writing was talking about why he made this decision to, um, to humiliate himself in this way. Um, and he, out, he, had way, he had ways of explaining it. He wanted to talk about how you know, he was doing it so that Regine wouldn't think about him, and there were all sorts of complex philosophical justifications which you can read for yourself. But the, 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 the um, upshot was that he and, he and Regine carried on this very kind of odd relationship for the rest of their lives. So there was this uh, continued partnership with this very, very much a philosophical love story. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there, but suffice it to say, if you're looking for more excuses to read Kierkegaard, this is one of them. Um, but where were we? Solving death, immortality. Um, this headline obviously made news, and here again, I want to be fair to Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Um, you know, there's, there's a bit of press uh, um, you know, exaggeration here. If you had Larry Page or, or Sergey Brin here, they would say, well, we're just interested in, in following the biotechnology research where it leads. Surely we're all in favor of extending human life. We don't know if we can really solve death, you know, but maybe we can, maybe we can live to be 200. There would be all kinds of um, sort of, uh, you know, technological justifications for, the, for, for this project, which most of us would agree with. This happens to be something that Kierkegaard thought a lot about. Death and, immorali death and immortality were, um, he, he saw them as paramount existential issues, and so he had some interesting, interesting things to say on the, on the subject. And one of his observations um, was that immortality isn't something that can, be that can be discussed as a kind of group subject along the lines of, is immortality good? Or wouldn't it be nice if we were all immortal? The question of discussions of, or issues of immortality only make sense to existing individuals. Am I immortal? Do I want to be immortal? Can I be immortal? Um, 
And it's a nice way to frame Kierkegaard's approach to, to subjects, when you look at it that way. Um, because when you, start to, when you start to ask yourself seriously questions like that, um, do I want to live forever if my life is essentially what it is now? Um, what, would that, what would that mean? If I was immortal, what do, I mean, do, I still, do I still have an interest in being married? Do I pursue a career? How do I spend that time? Um, there are all sorts of, of complicating questions that arise. And Kierkegaard was very much prodding us to ask those questions. And with respect to, this, with respect to sort of the technology projects in this area, um, I'd suggest that maybe these questions aren't front and center. These are questions that need to be asked, and it's a contribution that Kierkegaard can make to the, make to the issue. Kierkegaard thought that death was defining for human individuals as we know them today. So one of the, the, the concept of death or the concept of, of life's finitude, the concept that things will end, structures at some level so much of what we do. And so Kierkegaard would also probably ask, you know, if, if you really do take away that concept of death, what, what, are, the, what are the other ripple effects of, 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 that, of that change? On a more positive note, Kierkegaard would say, or you know, Kierkegaard would look at the subject of, of immortality and say, um, "Great. Suppose for you know, taking for granted for the moment that that one is immortal or that I am immortal. That that is nice in some ways, but does it really change my task? So if the if one of the main purposes of human life right now is to figure out how I should best live my life." Does that task change if my life is extended indefinitely? And in this, in this particular passage, Kierkegaard wants to argue that no, it doesn't, that that mission, that, that, very, that very sort of uh, personal mission would continue indefinitely. So maybe immor immor immortality is not the, uh, the quantitative change that, or the qualitative change that we'd expect. I liked this headline that I saw in Wired. You know, Silicon Valley would rather cure death than make life worth living. But I think that the hidden, the hidden complication here is that Kierkegaard would look at this and say, yeah, that's probably true. In some ways, solving death is an easier, is more of a technological problem and an easier one than making life worth living. But he would then follow up, to, he would then ask, but is, my, is making life worth living really a technology problem? What is it that Silicon Valley is actually going to do that is going to make my life more worth living in that kind of qualitative way? Let's turn to the final, the final problem, and by, by, by all means, the most speculative one. Um, again, I was, attracted to, I was attracted to this issue of, of the singularity and the sort of, um, you know, sort of quality, this sort of dramatic evolution of the species, just because Hegel was, there, there were ideas like this in Kierkegaard's own time that he was wrestling with in his work, and I thought it was an interesting parallel. Um, it's interesting that in, in, sort of the, in our intellectual tradition, every so often, you know, every century, every couple centuries, this kind of grandiose aspiration pops up again. Probably never really goes away, but it, it just at various periods of time, it really gains currency. So again, you can see with that top graph, it'll give you a, a, a general sense of how the singularity is talked about. And there are lots of different schools, and there's lots of different ways that this is, that this is discussed. But essentially, the idea is that um, our... our um, computer technology is expanding, is, is increasing in power so rapidly um, that it is just a matter of time before, before we start augmenting our own brains with this technology. So we're going to have super memories, instant internet connections, so we have all knowledge available to us at all times, our computational power is going to be increased. And then once we have, have achieved this kind of superhuman intelligence, we're quickly going to be able to, to or we're going to be able to continue that rapid evolution, so we're going to morph into something like a new species, this sort of super smart, you know, species and our current, our current human cells will seem like, you know, we'll, it, there won't be much relationship between what we are now and what we will be. And this kind of, this kind of uh, grandiose ambition um, gets explained or gets discussed in a lot, of, a lot of surprisingly flowery prose from a bunch of software engineers. So one of the guys who, who really popularized this concept, not who began it, but really popularized it, is a guy by the name of Ray Kurzweil, um, who wrote a book called The Singularity Is Now about 10 years ago. And you can get a sense of that quote, just how, just how large these ambitions are. Um, and I'll underline again what we, th th what we discussed a, a, a moment ago about how the cosmos was coming to a kind of, of self-consciousness. 
So this is much more than just sort of tricking out our brains with, with new kinds of technology. This is about human, on, human ingenuity kicking off this dramatic evolution in the cosmos itself um, and creating new species, new super species as a, as, a, as a consequence. And Kierkegaard never wrote directly about this, obviously. This was not, this was not quite on his radar screen. Um, but I'll hearken back to that, that quote that he, uh, or the, the passage that we read in which he, taught, he asked Hegel, you know, can we be so sure that we've evolved into something more? That, that, we, that we in the early 19th century have evolved so much beyond the, the ancient Greeks in terms, of, in terms of wisdom and goodness. And I think Kierkegaard would, would certainly ask that question here. He always had not, he always, his eyebrows were always raised um, whenever, whenever human reason um, claimed to be able to perform miraculous things like this. Um, but I, so I think he would, he would approach it at a, at, an exist, at, a, at a large level like that, but even from an existential level, it's interesting to think about um, as a human individual, if you were offered the chance to, to augment your thinking in this way, if you, were really, if, you, if you knew that you could be hooked up to some kind of, some kind of computer that would dramatically increase your, your thinking abilities, your memories, um, would, you, would you do it? Um, how would that how would that change your experience um, as, a, as an existing individual self? And I certainly don't have a lot of details to offer on this, but the questions should be asked. And, and to some extent they are. I mean, Ray Kurzweil will ask them if you read the Max Tegmarks of the world. There are certainly thinkers that are, are thinking these questions through, um, but perhaps, perhaps more need to be doing them. Or you know, perhaps these questions need to be given higher priority. I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. Um, this was a just another. It was it was it was a discussion of what's known as cybernetic totalism, and this is essentially what we've just discussed um, in terms of uh, how technological progress is thought by some to shade into other kinds of of human development. Um, It's worth noting that, that even figures like Ray Kurzweil, and again, I'm treating him somewhat like Hegel as a, as a, as a, as a standard bearer, bearer, bearer for a very large and diverse set of thinkers. Um, but he shares with Hegel um, certain, certain qualities. And it's interesting that, that even, for, even for Ray Kurzweil, um, he comes back to consciousness and realizes that's still a mystery to be solved. That yes, he can plot out the evolution of, of, of our cosmos to self-understanding um, and, and sort of diagram out that, that, that cosmic, on that cosmic kind of scale. But at the end of the day, we're not really sure what human consciousness is, and that's such an integral piece of that evolution that we do need to spend some time thinking about it. And I'm gonna end there for, and, and, and start the discussion, or hopefully we can do a, few, a little bit of a discussion and some questions. Um, but in a, in a nice bit of, of irony that Kierkegaard would have appreciated, he loved irony. I have to, I have to take off an hour to go back to the, the global tech forum at Sonoma State, where I'm gonna be listening to various C-level execs talk about augmented and virtual reality. So I th was, it, this, just, this was a coincidence, but I thought I'd put this on as, as the last slide, to, uh, uh, again, as a, as a bit of irony. Um, and with that, if, uh, if we're up for some questions or discussion, that would be, I'd love it. Well, Mark, I, I, this is a really fascinating talk that you've given. And um, my mind has gone in so many different directions of what I want to say. But basically, it seems to me that Silicon Valley, that Kierkegaard really understood that Silicon Valley is equating details and facts and information with consciousness. And I was happy to see that last Kurzweil quote, because at least he does understand that there's a problem in making that equation of connecting um, consciousness and, and um, thinking. Uh, you know, I'm within f less than four years of 90 years old, and I've had an incredibly wonderful life. Consciousness is one of those things that I did not create. It came to me. I filled my head with knowledge, but I did not create the consciousness that made that possible. And I'm very, very happy for death. I can't imagine living without death in the future. It would be unthinkable.
It's an interesting. And I've had a happy life, and I enjoy <laughs> our coffee chats. <laughs> it's it's an interesting observation, um, and it's it's this kind of viewpoint is is somewhat uncomfortable to discuss, at least in our culture, and yet it's it's a, it's a valuable one, and I think I think Kierkegaard would have would have echoed simil similar sen sentiments. Oh, please. What happened to art? Was it dropped somewhere in the 19th century? Was there nothing but logic? Where is the development of emotions? They need as much training as the intellect. And they can fool us any time they come along and kick us. In other words, where's the art? So, you know, that's a really, it's an interesting observation um, because, of course, we're heading in at this, at that period in history, we're heading into the Romantic era where art suddenly becomes, goes front and center. Um, and lots of thinkers start to ask, you know, isn't, isn't the true reconciliation here in the artistic world? Um, Hegel himself uh, equated art, religion, and philosophy as the three ways that, that we could, we could as, as, pe as, as people, ex approach some of these issues. Um, yeah, the, the question of art is really is a really interesting one. Thank you. Uh, so this question isn't super formulated, so I'm not really sure what I want to say. But um, it seems to me that Kierkegaard was a response to Hegel that went in the direction of a more extreme, as you say, inwardness and individuality and takes us in that, in that dimension of the self. But then there's another response to Hegel that takes us toward the dimension of the otherness of society and as the self as defined in community and in society, you know, beginning with Marxism mm -hmm. and communitarianism. And I'm wondering if you've given any thought at all to how that maps onto the direction that Silicon Valley is taking. Because it almost appears as if this individual identity is, is an explosion of my consciousness that is somehow um, going outward from, from me as an individual. But what about identity as being something that's continually dynamically being formed in conversation with others around me as individuals and as, as society as a whole. As I say, this isn't super formed, but that's just what I No, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice rejoinder, too. Um, yeah, this, this was obviously, a, as I admitted at, at a few points, this is a very narrowly constructed argument. I mean, I'm talking not just about Kierkegaard, but really about Kierkegaard's perception of the intellectual climate of his time, which was not always fair. Um, and coming at it from a different perspective like that, if, if, our, if, our, if we want to talk about human identity more specifically and how is it formed, not just from a Kierkegaardian perspective, but taking into account the way that technology influences that, that, kind, of, that kind of creation, that's a, re that's a really interesting discussion. And that's certain, that, that certainly, peop people, have, people have, have certainly noticed that and talked about the way that, that technology is, you know, it changes the way that we view ourselves, the way that we interact with others. Um, not so much Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard had a little bit probably more of a, I don't think essentialist is quite the right word, but somehow it was a little bit more, you know, the individual identity was a, a, a little more self-contained, internally focused, that's a good way to put it. Um, so he wasn't as concerned with how the external world uh, influenced it, but if, if our goal is to talk about identity in a broader context like that, absolutely. Uh, actually, let me, one other follow-up point on that would be the issue of avatars. That's where you see it coming up a lot. You know, in uh, whether it's at a very simple level on, on one's Facebook page or in virtual reality, um, the notion that we're now able to project into a digital realm um, sort of creatures of our own imagination and present our, you know, how we're not limited any longer by any kind of physical constraint for the way that we present ourselves to others, at least in certain, certain circumstances. That's where I see a lot of those discussions of identity taking interesting shapes. 
if we start talking about the, uh, the the consciousness as you were talking about, it seems to me that they could say there is some could say that there is no there there, uh, and and that's where we're seeing for yeah. we're seeking it. Um, is there a moral dimension to this? Did Kierkegaard talk, talk about that at all in the development of uh, human consciousness? Yeah, very much so, and I probably should have emphasized it more. Um, there was there was a very strong ethical and religious component to Kierkegaard's thought. Um, Kierkegaard would often often describe our primary duty as individuals, as subjective thinking individuals, as ethical. Um, how we bring ourselves into relation with the community around us. So um, I skipped over one, one note that is worth mentioning, for, especially for those of you who, who haven't read a lot of Kierkegaard. Um, in the past, he's often been lumped in with irrationalist thinkers. So that Kierkegaard is all about arbitrary choices and simply leaping to conclusions in whatever, whatever area of life. Um, but to your point, Kierkegaard's idea of the, subject, of the individual duty was to, it was to explore one's, one's self all of, and all of one's particularity, um, and then to bring oneself into alignment with broader truths of the ethical variety and then also for Kierkegaard very much of the religious variety. So I didn't talk of the religious variety. Um, so Kierkegaard was very much a theologian as well. Um, and so he, he, had, he had a strong interest in talking about um, very spiritual elements of, of one's life above and beyond the ethical elements. So it's a, it's a point, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and then, um, I, I have a, I'm thinking about something, I'm making a couple of connections, Mark, and, and then I, I have a question uh, I'm thinking about the fictional characters, the android characters in st like Star Trek's data. Oh, yeah. and then there's a new series called Black Matter that has a similar yeah. character where the, uh, the android character is in, in this recent one. I don't know if anybody's seen this. We were watching some episodes last night. Uh, Dark Matter. Um, the android character I is, is that um, person described by Kurt Vile, right? All right. Um, uh, it has his connection to all information, like um, like Q in Star Trek, sure, right? yeah, and, and so and, and and not just like the data character in Star Trek, programmed with with you know software, and like an Android version of Q but in Star yeah, Trek, yeah, okay, um, and, and and then these characters are always in to make the story work. They these characters are always in pursuit of inwardness, right, um, of subjectivity, uh, which they which seems always out of their grasp. Mm -hmm. I remember. Uh, data and Star Trek episodes studying irony. And as, as you know, um, the most recent text of Kierkegaard's that I've read is his dissertation Concept of on irony. irony. And so I'm still freshly thinking about, um, about that aspect of his thought and his relationship to the world and, and, uh, and how that plays in this. Uh, all of this are just kind of associations I'm making that, um, that kind of set up. My, my question is, you mentioned this in some of the, the promotional material. Um, how, what would he say to big data? And, and I'm thinking of big data yeah. specifically in, uh, I, I you know, travel in the, in the realm of uh, educational policies, right? Yeah. The larger uh, uh, political world of forming educational policies in, in the use by using big data yeah. in the same way that um, Google proceeds by using big data. And it seems to me that there's a conflict there between what Kierkegaard is talking about of individuality and inwardness. Because big data- We're, we're thinking of the commodification of education yeah. here in some sense? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it, I mean, there's some argue that the world of big data is a way of, some people call it big nudging, mm -hmm. right? That, that it's a, a way of collapsing individuality into uh, a collectivism. Do, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, probably roughly the same as yours. I mean, I see where you're going with that point and I agree. And actually, in the, the talking about education as a, as a case study Using, as a, using, ed, the, using ideas of education as a case study for this is, a, is a, an, an interesting way to get at some of the issues. So um, as Eric was mentioning, there's, the, there's all sorts of debates in education uh, around the extent to which you can have effective education 
with just massive classrooms. Ma like, what is it, massive online? Um, MOAX. MOAX, yeah. Um, or even, even at a smaller level, you know, having to, you know, at Sonoma State, we have plenty of classes where we have an instructor online talking to some hundreds of students about, about a particular subject. And there are, this is so attractive in certain ways, right? Financially, um, just as a conceptual model, look how innovative we're being. But on the back end, there's lots of discussion of, all right, so you've got these classes, and yeah, you can give out these certificates, and you can find ways to, to quantitatively say that you've, you've disseminated this information in a, in, a, in a reasonable way. But are the kids really learning? Are the students really learning? Um, and it seems like the pendulum is swinging back. It's never, never, it never, we were never whole hog for the notion of internet education, but the idea that in settings like this, face-to-face, one-on-one, that there's something that is transmitted in a more effective way um, than in other much larger, much less personal situations. Um, and getting back to, the, getting back to um, Kierkegaard's relation to Socrates, you know, you think back to the Socratic model where it's, it's you and your teacher sort of engaging in questions face to face and that somehow this was a way to, that tra this was a way to transmit not just objective facts, but also a, a, a way of being. That's how you learn how to be, is by, by being led, by seeing, witnessing examples and being led through, the, through this kind of pedagogical exercise. Um, and Kierkegaard, I think, would be happy to extend that kind of metaphor, that kind of case study, to any number of other areas. So it's a nice example. You had a fascinating slide on uh, the quality of life versus immortality, and I was wondering, uh, in, here in the 21st century, operating under the assumption that uh, the physical universe is in a state of uh, entropy, how would yeah. that change Kierkegaard's viewpoint on the immortality versus quality of life? So if Kierkegaard was looking out 14 billion years into the future as we're all sort of dissipating into, into cold, empty space? <laughs> it's a good question. I, I, I've never thought that went through, actually. Um, Kierkegaard would probably deny the premise. At the end of the day, I think Kierkegaard and probably Hegel and probably enough of, of the, the futurists that are writing today would say, would, 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 would probably say, oh, there's got to be something a little bit more. Um, this, and this would be a very controversial point. I wouldn't want to have to defend it in, in writing or in a, in a more academic setting. But Kierkegaard, I think, would say, you know, no, that's not, there's something more here. That there is a, there is a, there is some kind of, there is some kind of, um, you know, mind behind creation, and there is some sort of, some sort of um, purpose that this is all serving. Um, so that's how, it, that's how it answered for Kierkegaard, but that, you know, other, other thinkers have certainly answered in different ways. I don't think, I don't think Sartre would have any problem saying, like, yeah, we're all, we're all cold atoms eventually. Like, that's, yeah. You know, being a theologian and being uh, a deep thinker, did he have some kind of concept of the ultimate aim of human life? Uh, yes, it would, but it would, yes, and a, a complicated one. Um, I think for this, I think the way that, that we would have to parse that out to mean human life on this earth with what human beings know, with our the, the finite, or with the constraints on our, on our thinking and experience. And that would be one pathway to take the discussion. And the other way would be um, wi with his sort of back underlying Christian beliefs. So at the end of the day, I think Kierkegaard would say something like, we have a creator. We can't really know the creator in any, in any detail while we're living in this world. But it's our duty as individuals to somehow put ourselves into alignment with whatever our, with whatever our purpose was or, or is. Right? And so there's certain moral and spiritual um, facets to go into this, and it's a lifelong search and struggle. Um, for, and actually, that's probably, I mean, that's how he would answer. Most, I, I'm saying that too definitively. I don't know how Kierkegaard would answer. But that would, that it, would, it, would be something along the, it would be something along those lines. Well, great. I think we've hit the noon hour, so let's give Mark a round of applause and thank him for his... Thank you. That was, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for the chance. Thank you to Eric Thompson, too.